I'm recording our Chaos Hangouts on February 26th. The update on Google Summer of Code is that um, Google accepted us as a organization. So now the students are going to storm all the projects, including ours in the mailing list. I already saw the first email come through. And so it would be great if the mentors could take it upon themselves to respond to these emails. And Where are the emails coming into here? The emails from students who would like to participate in Google Summer of Code. Right. Where are they okay. sending the emails to? Uh, the chaos mailing list. Uh, okay. They, they, okay. If, if they read, if they read the, the text that we submitted, they should be doing uh, sending messages to the, to the mailing list and uh, commenting on the issues that we opened with the microtask and all of that. Because if, if I remember well, the idea was to um, introduce themselves in the mailing list and uh, comment any issue that they may have in the issue with respect to the idea they want to select for the microtask. Yes, that is how we are doing it. And so the students are messaging us to let them know they are interested. They will pick up a micro task, create a repository to work on it, and then create a pull request against a um, document in our governance repository where we keep track of everyone interested in being a student with us. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many spots we got. Last time I checked, um, Google Sum of Code website did not tell us. So I'm waiting for them to update the dashboard. I just checked it's not up yet mm -hmm. to know how many students we can mentor this year. Okay. We proposed last year they gave them all to us, right? Yes. So. Last year we got two, but I don't know how many it is this year. Okay. It's at least one. Yeah. Hmm. I think Matt was, I mean, I'm next here. I thought. I am here. Oh, Matt is here. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Never Sorry. say bye. I, mean, I told people. I had already told people you were. You took a bicycle spill, and yeah, have... no, it's all right. It's all good. Good. <laughs> That's good to hear. Yeah. So, have, uh, do you, yeah. Do you know that we got two, Matt? I... No, I'm looking right now at the dashboard too, and it doesn't say. Okay. And they haven't sent any other email other than the original congratulations email. That's all. Okay. No okay. Um, I was thinking about this too. Um, I know we have a variety of different projects. I just was wondering this morning um, if there would be any way for, if, let's say we got two to connect with the work that the common group is doing too. It would just, it would be really cool to try to make some points of connection across the work groups. That's all. So I, I don't think we ever specify like the metrics that would be worked on, if I recall in the, like the descriptions. Georg, you could check me if I'm wrong. The, the one I put in uh, for Augur was focused on risk. Okay. So, uh, but I mean, risk broadly construed touches lots of things, so. Okay, just, just a thought. Georg, do you know if the ones from Grimoire Lab had a like a area focus? I don't remember okay. that they did. I think it's technology specific, the descriptions we have. Okay. So maybe if we could just create some connection, whether explicitly say with, with common or explicitly with risk or explicitly with GMD, it'd be nice to kind of get both of those things um, moving forward. That's just, that was a thought. I don't know how other people feel about that. I, I would agree with the thought. Okay. I think it's something that can be worked into projects. I think so too. Okay, cool. I guess Dawn, with Dawn on the line, would you see any potential 
work with common or is it just is it still too early perhaps um it's a little bit early when do the google summer of code students start may i think at the end of their semester so we had one yeah. student who was early may and one student who was very late may last year the community i mean i would i would think the oh go ahead Garrick. and then coding starts at the end of may yeah i mean i would think that by by may we might be in a better shape to have a little more clarity around which ones need a bit more definition. Okay. Right, we'll just I don't keep know. It I mean, does it does it make sense to have them focused in kind of a, a working group or on a technology like you know they're they're working on a Grimoire Labs project or an Augur project or? Well, I think they ultimately have to. The intention is to ultimately advance a technology, you know? <clears throat> but if the if the advancement can be kind of in the context of say risk metrics or uh, common metrics or GMD metrics or DNI metrics for that So it could be adding one of the metrics to, to one of the tools to advance that particular technology, for yeah, example? So I, okay. Yeah, I think the focus could be on the tool itself. And because you have to, because you're trying to advance it, you might may as well work with something that um, is live in the community. Yeah. Just a thought. Again, I, we might have to. Yeah, we'll think about it a little more. It's a bit it's a bit early to know exactly what that might look like in the okay. relative to the common metrics working group anyways, just since we're still so new. Okay. Cool. Yeah, we have one month to discuss project ideas with students and they have to hand them in first week of April. So we have to have it nailed down by beginning of April. Okay. I had two other things that I wanted to bring up. That's why I forced myself to be here today. Um, one was I, I would just kind of like to point out an observation that I made to Georg yesterday that um, it's really, to me, it's, it's really great on the DNI calls, seeing the number of different people who are there on a weekly basis now, that it really feels like the group of people is expanding um, really positively. So I just, I wanted to say that kind of more broadly. It's just, if you take a look at who's on the calls now, it's becoming, uh, it's, it's a more diverse set of people than it was even just a month ago, which is really cool. So. Are there it? any lessons on how that happened that could be applied for the other working groups? I don't know. Good work. <laughs> Not saying you do bad work. <laughs> oh, yeah, I wasn't, that wasn't, I wasn't gonna jump to be defensive just yet. I thought I'd wait a little while. I think we may have gotten maybe one or two from the ChaosCon tutorial, people who got interested in it there. But um, but there's some other people that have been attending. Garrick, maybe you know exactly how they got involved, like Rye and Langdon and a few others. Um, I think it was, through advocacy within the Linux Foundation, because we have several from the Linux Foundation who joined. So maybe Kate Stewart, I'm, I'm speculating here. No, you know what? I think Sarah has been pulling people in now that, I, now that you say that, because she's marketing for the Linux Foundation. And I think she has pulled a few people in as a result of hearing people who were working on DNI and kind of pointing them to our work group. So maybe it's that evangelist role. Yeah, I mean, maybe Kate's pulled some people in too. That's a possibility. And I think what gets the people to show up, at least from what I'm hearing, is they're really interested in solving the problem. And I, I think they like the way that we work together, maybe. I, I'm just assuming it. So. Well, good job. <laughs> it's really great to see. <laughs> um, and then the other thing I had was, I'm going to put it in the chat here. Um, so as part of the upcoming Open Source Leadership Summit, um, we're taking a look at the charter, right? So we're looking at changing the charter 
uh, honestly, just to reflect the structure of the community more appropriately. It's not to really change the direction of anything. It's just when the charter was written, um, it was aimed around software and technical, but obviously, and it didn't account for the working groups. And now we obviously have working groups and just trying to update the charter there. But one of the things that's in the charter is this point, all new inbound code contributions must be accompanied by a developer certificate of origin sign off. And we're not doing that. So no. <laughs> I don't think any work, working group is doing this. No, not at all. There are, there are bots that will check for that. Exactly. I was, I was thinking, cause I know Kubernetes does this. Yeah, Kubernetes, we do it for the CLA. Okay. Um, so there's a, it's a different, um, it's actually, I think, I'm pretty sure it's a different bot. There's one bot that checks for um, contributor license agreement signatures. Okay. And I think there's another bot that checks for um, DCO. We were just looking at that within Pivotal because we just uh, converted one of our projects from a CLA to a, D sorry, D developer certificate of origin is what a DCO is. Okay. And there, there are bots that will check for that and say, hey, no, you need to resubmit this with a DCO, a, which is basically the signed off by. It's just a checkbox, isn't it, basically? They just go and their profile does it. I mean, they personally check off on it. Is that right? And then their profile is. No, the commit actually includes a, uh, it, it'll include a thing that will say signed off by and have your name and email address. Oh, okay. And that's actually a part of the commit itself. So it's a, it's a git command that you issue when you. I see. When you do the commits. Okay. Is there an easy way to do this on, on GitHub? Like without having somebody to do git commit minus S or whatever, like, like elongated stuff that people need to do. But yeah, I, I don't know if there's, yeah. I mean, I, I had a similar issue that came up within like GitLab. I mean, apparently that's like, you don't have to do it in the command line, but, uh, if there's an easy way to do that in GitHub and make sure that it's kind of spelled out in the contributing doc that, you know, when you're doing this through GitHub, like you're signing off with, uh, you're signing off on DCL, but that might be an easiest thing to do. But that's just my thought. I know there are ways to put conditions on pull requests. Yeah. I, okay. So a, a DCO, does that go on it goes on every commit. So it, it's assigned to the commit, not to the person. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. So if I, if yeah, I did five um, commits, every commit oh, that I did would have a DCO on it. Is that correct? Yeah. Every commit for the project would have to have a, um, okay. it's, it's, it's us. Yeah. So, so it's, so the DCO is kind of the process and that's what you're signing off on, mm -hmm. but your, um, your commit would just include a signed off by line. So this is what the kernel uses. Okay. And has used for a very long time. Okay. Um, well, I will, I'll put that on my, my own personal action item list to take a look at this and maybe come back next week with some options. I'm not super familiar with this area, so I might, I don't know, I might reach out to a few of you just if I have questions. I'm not entirely sure how this workflow works. Don, I mean, for your project, like, was it on GitHub? Like, I don't know how you implemented like DCO for the project you were talking about. I, I need to look because it was a different engineering team. They brought me in on the decision about whether or not to use a, whether or not we could convert it to a DCO and we ultimately decided to do that. Mm -hmm. um, but I will, I'll look and see what they're, what they actually ended up doing. Yeah, cool. Yeah, it would be nice if there's like an easy checkbox on settings on GitHub that we can just turn on, but maybe I'm just being overly optimistic. Oh yeah, that would be awesome. <laughs> yeah. I would hope. There are some. Well, I, yeah. I've seen things I was like just that. Googling and there's a to do group thread from two years ago saying they would also like to have a checkbox in the GitHub isn't face, but there is none. Yeah. Uh, another yeah, way a, around that. Sorry, Don. No, go ahead, Brian. Another way around that was I've worked on projects that have put specific templates into pull requests. 
So when you create a new one, there is a specified template on what you have to do. Yes. And it will be rejected if it, you try to put something in without the template. So in the template, you could have whatever words you need to make it a legitimate DCO. Like I so and so hereby verify, you know, whatever whatever words you need. And it would just be transparent. So every time they made a pull request, it would be in the PR. And if it were merged, it would be there in the commit and you're done. There's no checkbox or anything. Do you have an example of that, Brian? I could go find something. Give if me a second. It's not too much work. Okay. Yeah. I mean, go ahead without me. I'll put it in the chat in a second. Okay. So we just we either need to do this or <laughs> remove it from the charter, <laughs> which I'm guessing Mike Dolan would not want to do. So I was muted. This is an example. I dropped it in the chat. This is the project I was talking about, um, which talks about how you what it should look like when you do the signed off by. Okay. And I saw Ray, you posted something as well. Yeah, that's the bot. I think like. I think Georg and uh, Sean mentioned. But. Okay. Okay, I just dropped in a sample pull request from the overt project. And if you go to that page real quick, yep. if you can see it, it, it basically the template's right there. And they have a number of things they wanted in there. They wanted to specify the changes, you know, that the pull request was submitted according to co contribution guidelines. And then there's a review request if need be. And every PR has that. So that if you if you make a PR in the overt project, that's the template that would show up. I'm not 100% sure how they set that up, but I don't get the sense it was hard. No, we have templates for a lot of things like this within Kubernetes too. Yeah, and that would take care of it. I mean, you just whatever words you have to do to make it a legitimate DCO. So yeah, it doesn't it doesn't quite take care of it though. I mean, because we can put it in the template, but the uh, the signed off by actually has to be on the commit instead oh. of the instead okay, of the pull sorry, request. All right, you, people yeah. actually have to use it, right? I mean, yeah, be on the commit. Okay, that's yeah. more solid. But the templates, the templates are a great idea because what we could do is we could put something in there about how you have to use the the process and link to it or something. Well, the, 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 I'm sorry. Go ahead, Jesus. No, the, the main practical problem that I see for this is that that's what I'm saying now on GitHub, you cannot do the thing off in the commit from the work interface. You need to do it that in Git. And uh, that means that you cannot use the online editor that GitHub provides, for instance, for changing uh, the name of the metric or some secrets have that some people are doing right now because it's very convenient. So it's, uh, it's the only implication I think then from the practical point of view. That it would be done at release and not every commit is that the, I'm sorry I didn't quite hear you. No, what, what I mean what I mean is that when you are making a change to the uh, via the web interface in GitHub, as far as we know, you are producing a commit, but that commit can cannot be signed up. You need to do that from the Git interface in the command okay. line. Which means that if, if if I'm right, people cannot do contribution just by clicking on the Git on any file on the web interface and uh, changing something simple that doesn't really need to uh, work in and, and sorry to uh, clone the, the full docker story. That's, that's a matter of convenience only, so it's not, not more than that. I see, okay. So I, I think the sign off is just a comment on the commit, it's not something else. And no, so no, that, that's, that's what I mean, but, but I think, uh, I, I mean, if you sign off, you actually actually signing with your uh, 
uh, with your address. Right, so yeah. I sign into GitHub and then I make a change and to have the DCO sign off, I have to write a comment on the commit that I signed off. Let me see. And it's I not really a comment on the commit, it's part of the commit message. That's what, yes. I, that's what I mean. But it's not only saying that, it's there is a sign. I mean, a digital signature. Let me check. I'm, I'm, maybe I'm wrong. Let me check. Yeah. If it's only a comment or a git message, commit message, then the template will help with the web interface. It seems that I'm wrong. It seems that it's only Kim that was. Um, um, yeah, as you were saying. Yeah, okay. I'm 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 wrong in that case. So it should be should be good enough. I'm going to to to, to dig deeper because I thought there was a, a digital signature involved. But maybe yeah. I'm, maybe I'm wrong. Yeah. Okay, yeah, no, there's no digital signature involved. It's it's part of the commit message, but it's it's very specific. It has to say signed off by and then your name and your yeah. email. No, I, I know that, but I yeah. thought that uh, I thought that Git was producing a, a digital signature at that point. But um, maybe I'm wrong. So um, yeah, if that's the case, in any case, uh, if that's like that, we could do that via the web interface too, because you can introduce a comment. To the web Is this to prevent against trolling? Is that the idea here? No, it's when you don't have a contributor license agreement. It's a way of having sort of a, a paper trail and um, not really a paper trail, but it's it's basically asking people to self-certify that they are indeed the owner of the code that they're submitting and that they're legally allowed to submit it to this project, okay. which is basically a summary of what, if you go to that developer certificate of origin yeah. org, that's kind of a summary of what that says. It basically, okay. basically you're saying I, Don Foster, um, am allowed to contribute this code to this project and I'm not, um, you know, I'm not contributing something that I shouldn't, that's under a different license, for example. Okay. And so you need to say that in the message, not in the code. Is it's that... part of the commit message when you do like a git commit dash uh, yeah. Well, you do a git commit dash s and it includes it in the message underneath the regular message. Okay. So you can see an example of this. If you go to that concourse link that I posted yep. um, and scroll down to the very bottom of that page, you can see exactly what the commit looks like. But down, you can just uh, include the commit okay. or you need to use the, the, the option in, the, in git, the minus s or minus sign off option to git. Um, I, I don't know. I've always, I've always seen it with a dash, a dash S. So here I can. Okay. Uh, because that, that's what I was saying. If it is only writing in the, uh, in the message, that's fine because we can do it via the GitHub or in the page. Uh, if it is something else, I mean, if the, if the minus S option in Git, that's something else. <coughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm quickly reading and I, I cannot understand. I was trying to share my screen to just so that we could look at an example. Um, so this is this is the example of how we're doing it, and this is what the commit looks like, and this is the command that you use to to add to add this to the bottom of your commit message. I mean, I'm guessing you could type that right into the into the commit message. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's easier to do a dash s because it pulls it right from your git config. Mm -hmm. I'm not well, sure. I, I know there is an option in git for that, but I don't know if that's only a helper so that you, you can also write it and that's it, or if the option does something else that can be somehow verified or something, I don't know. And I, I thought that it was doing some kind of digital signature, but then really not, and it doesn't, so. No, I mean, if you look, this is the developer certificate of origin language. It really is just saying that it was created by me under the license in the file. Mm -hmm. 
I have permission to do this. Yeah. Okay. There's no, there's no, nothing about a digital signature. No. I've, I've never seen, any, seen that. Okay, thank you, Dan. So, um, uh, in any case, uh, I'm, I'm going to do a couple of tests just to see whether the web interface works. Because in that case, we can uh, um, try to do a digital signature. If you would do that, Jesus, that would be great. A couple of tests that we could talk about next week. Yeah, I'm also going to talk to our developers because I'm, I'm pretty much sure that they know because they're, they're using this in other projects. So probably they know. But, but yeah, I, I'm going to reset that. I, I, I tell to you next week. That'd be great. Don, are you still sharing your screen? No, I think I turned it off. Oh. Did you, you want me to share it again? No, no, no. It's just, it's my bad. Sorry. Okay. <clears throat> Hey, those were my issues. Those were those were my things. Google summary of code, good job. DNI, good job. And then the DCO thing, which I didn't have any bearings on. I just have a quick thing. I, I left a comment on on uh, I mean thanks Georg and, and Kevin for uh, starting the discussion on and outlining options on releasing chaos metrics. Um, so, and yeah, I, I was on vacation last week, so I, I missed most of the discussion, but thanks for kicking that off. Uh, I just had a, like a quick question at the end. Um, I, I'm, Cause I think a lot of us are, have been in this for a while. Um, so, I mean, I, I want to know from, from an outsider perspective, if somebody's like approaching chaos for the first time, is, is there uh, like a huge benefit of having a version like metrics? Uh, would people even want to like look at what was released like six months ago? But that's just a question. Like I love to hear uh, people's feedback. I know Toby chimed in, but I like to hear from other people on what their thoughts are. Uh, I, I haven't made up my mind on, on the three, propo three proposals. I think they're all good, but uh, just had a question on, I guess, proposal number two. Can somebody drop a link to that in the, in the chat? Yeah, let me find that. It is issue 125 in the metrics repository. I posted the link in the chat. Thank right. you. You beat me to it. I think that uh, um, one of the comments by Toby clarifies the real difference because it seems that we were talking about two different things. One was um, versioning at the global level, let's say all the metrics version something, while some other people were talking about um, versioning every single metric. So that we have the version for this metric already. So I was more in favor of uh, releasing everything so that we can say, this metric as defined in version whatever of the chaos metric. And doing that, say, every three or every four months, so that we can have version 101 of our metric, and any of the metrics defined in it gets defined by the complete chaos metrics. Um, so for that, it's it, it's a bit like you do with software. So you release the full software, and each of the functionalities of the software gets released at the same time. Uh, I understand the benefits of having every specific metric with uh, releases, but I find it uh, too complicated. I'm talking about the last two comments. So the the, the one by Kobe, which is the, the I don't know how to reference it. Four, four days ago, the, the second starting from the end, before the one by Ray, and then Ray asking about what's different. So. 
And, and with respect to the benefit of having Russian metrics as a tool, the idea is that we hopefully are going to be improving over time. So that maybe at some point, uh, some metrics that are initial in version one to two get changed because we find out that, I don't know, the, the number, the name is bad, or maybe we want to extend the, the, the meaning of the metric somehow because that's important, whatever. And maybe one year later, we discover that such and such metrics should have a, a slightly different definition or maybe a completely different definition. So that's why, at least from the point of view of implementation, it would be nice being able to say something like, I'm implementing this and this metrics as of uh, Chaos version one, or as of Chaos version 1.2 or whatever. I think it is the implementers, to your point, Jesus, who yeah. have the need for a version, not, not necessarily. So the versions help the implementers be precise about what we've actually implemented. I well, think, I think they, they also help in discussions in general, so that you don't right. you avoid uh, avoid misunderstandings where maybe somebody is talking about an old version of the metric or whatever, and and you ensure that we are talking about the same version because you mentioned that. But the still, implementers are of course the, the most concerned with it. And I think Toby's point is more about releases, that the, the having the releases or a release in general lets people know that there's something that they can reference and apply that, that is you know complete like i think in, implied by the idea of a release from toby i think is the idea that whatever we are releasing is reasonably complete by some measure mm -hmm. so we wouldn't release metrics that are not fully fleshed out yeah but but even if they are maybe one year later you learn that you need to change something right so that, that, that's, that doesn't really problem. Hopefully we don't have to do that often. And hopefully version one is going to be like version 0.9 plus some more stuff. Right. From time to time, maybe we need to change something. I agree. It's going to happen. Yeah. Yeah, getting at Toby's last, last question there. Um, he says basically that he doesn't think there's consensus as to what's needed, which is absolutely true. And I think that's what we have teed up for a decision at the governing board meeting at the Open Source Leadership Summit, because we can't decide what technical solution we want until we decide whether or not we need versioned metrics. And that needs to be a, a decision that's made. Yeah, but if we, if we can find a consensus in the community, it would be nice because I think that very likely the board is just going to do this. Uh, if we don't have a consensus, then we need to be uh, very specific on how to explain it to the board because um, many of the people there maybe don't have the full context and it can be a lengthy discussion if we don't have clear options and mm -hmm. are rationals to vote. So this, this ticket was trying to uh, basically discuss it, I think. So um, I'm still thinking that we need versioning and I think that there is better to version at the, at the full or the, the old metrics level, not, not simple metrics. And, uh, and the release is there, simplify things from the point of view, uh, it's the only moment where you need to do everything coordinated. So that during three months, for instance, you can advance with all the metrics independently, and before release, you need to basically coordinate everything. And only uh, once every three, four months, really. But I'm open to other, to other options. So uh, in fact, I think that we need to try anything that we decide and probably this can six months in the future if it works with the Yeah, <clears throat> my, it's, it is interesting to me how much, um, how many different opinions there are on this. This has been interesting to me, um, just in terms of versioning in general. I didn't, I didn't think it was that thorny of an issue, but apparently it is. In good, for good or bad, I don't mean that, I don't mean yeah. to say people are right or wrong. I just found it interesting that there's so many different thoughts on this. Um, I, I am a little concerned that we're just going to go in circles forever. What, yeah. um, I guess, is there anybody that could synthesize briefly for us? What are the, what's the argument? I'm like scanning the page. What's the argument against versioning? It's basically a continuous delivery. So that instead of uh, uh, closing versions at some point in time, uh, you always have the latest version. Right. And uh, as you modify, <coughs> you go on, and every new change to the metrics is like a um, release. Yeah. Uh, and, and 
Yeah, and my concern is, I mean, if there's real no, you know, demand for it, because I mean, there, there's a certain amount of work that needs to be done if we're going to have version metrics, right? I mean, if there's no demand for it, then then why go through the pain, like having like different versions, like how many, however many times you release. So that's that's sort of my concern. Uh, and if if there's real no outcry for doing this, then why take on additional work for, I mean, there's somebody will have to do this like administrative work like a few times a year, right? However many times we decide to release. Uh, and I think there's an easy way of doing this to get people what they're, what they're looking for. But that's, that's just sort of my concern. But um, yeah, I wasn't necessarily coming from a continuous delivery perspective like Toby is, but I, I see his point as well. Like, um, oh, from my point of view, continuous delivery is fine as long as you can tag a specific point in time where you yeah. want to, let's say, release. And that's mainly for reference. It's not only for saying this is better than anything else or something like that. It's just right. this is the release so that in the future, if I'm implementing, I know what I'm implementing because usually this is going to be a moving target. Even for the metrics that we can find more conciliated, maybe one year from now we need to change things in there. And uh, and even for the discussion itself. So for instance, if we now decide to count commits in such and such way, and in one year from now we decide to count commits in another way, we need to discuss. I'm talking about version one or I'm talking about version two. Just to clarify. Yeah, so. I think Kate had some strong feelings in favor of versioning them for specific reasons that I, I don't re really remember, frankly. I don't have any strong opinions either way, um, but I do think that someone needs, like you said, Sean, someone needs to synthesize this and put together a pros and cons document, and we need to get some clarity for, for the board to make a decision on, because every time we talk about this in this meeting, we just go in circles and... Yeah don't get any kind of any kind of consensus yeah. and i don't want the board meeting to go that way too because we're sort of counting on the board meeting to make a decision and we need to go in there with something i think a little more with a bit more clarity of thought and pros and cons and something a bit more deliberate i can volunteer to synthesize the pros and cons and the arguments that we've heard so far and then i'll circulate a google doc so we can edit it before the governing board meeting. The, the principal concern I remember awesome. expressing was related to tool developers knowing what they're implementing and being able to tell people who use those tools what is implemented. Put that uh, in the pro list, Georg. Put that on the pro side, the tool developers. So. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I, I guess I don't quite understand why that's an issue like why do we care if somebody implemented version two versus version one because in the end we want to be specific about metrics for a reason and the idea is to to say when we are for instance counting commits this is the way we count commits whichever it is and uh, when you're implementing it it, it uh, and, and you apply that to a repository you need to get 334 and not 335 or 336 because you are counting in, in a slightly different way or in a completely different way. And that applies to all of the metrics. And the idea is to have a single name and uh, a way of implementing that name. And that's what we mean for, say, whatever, time to close an issue, time to uh, finish a code review, number of commits in a repository, whatever. And, uh, and either we are precise or all the effort um, is not then because it, if we if we are discussing a lot about do we count merge commits or not do we count all requests or only those that are closed or whatever if then somebody can come and say no i'm implementing something that's slightly different but that means that maybe the result in our repository is completely different and that's the main reason to be precise if for any reason we prefer not to enter that way and we say well being precise is not important for us for any reason I completely agree that we don't need really uh, versioning and stuff like that. Yeah. I mean, maybe I'm the making the general idea of counting commits is going to be always yeah. the same. It's a detail with me change. I mean, maybe I'm making things too complicated, but you know, does it like there's a vendor that wants to implement specific aspects of version two of chaos? Like, do they need to implement everything, or you know, do they you know can they just implement ninety eight percent of it and two percent of it they just 
you know, create their own implementation of it. So that, that's something that we didn't define yet, but I yeah. think that at least they should be uh, um, able of, of saying something like, we are implementing this and this and this and this metrics, a long list of them, as of Chaos 2 version, uh, version 2, for instance. And, uh, and then may maybe we can later decide, well, either you implement everything or you cannot say it's Chaos or whatever. That's something that we can decide in the future. But so, at least for now, I would like to know this uh, software is implementing version 2. At this, this list of metrics is exactly what version 2 says. Ray, my thought on, on that is in terms of versioning, that I, I think it's possible that the way that the metrics are determined might change over time. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I think that the versioning, it just at least specifies that whatever, I'll just pick version two versus version one. Version two is a, a finer grain specification of a particular metric. That, that's all. Would we also that we, that we make changes? So for instance, consider time to close a pull request. Imagine that right now we decide that we are having this metric and we call it exactly like this, time to close a pull request. And we decide that all the pull records should be included. But we discuss for one year or whatever, and somebody comes with a nice use case and they say, well, that number is really not useful. It's mu it is much better to consider only those pull records that were actually closed. And forget about those that were abandoned because in, in GitHub you never know and whatever. And then we decide, okay, let's move the definition to say, when we say time to close pull requests, we say only those that were actually closed. That's going to change the numbers in a lot of repositories. And, and you need to be able of saying, I'm, I'm supporting this or this other version because they are different and they, they're going to have different results. And you cannot really say this is better than the other or even this is more high grain than the other. They are just different. And maybe for any reason we decide the second one is more useful and we change to that. That's something that shouldn't, shouldn't happen a lot because we are supposed <laughs> to produce a set of metrics from the very beginning. But who knows? We don't really have a lot of experience. More people are going to join. Maybe they have uh, new opinions, new ideas, new use cases that we didn't consider. So I foresee that in the next few years, very likely, some of our core metrics are going to change in meaning. If we are, uh, I mean, if we get the feedback from the community and we heard and we listen to the feedback from the community. That may happen or not, but my, my impression is we should be prepared for that. And that's like in any standard. So things change with time and you need to adjust to that, to that. And you need to say, this is a standard version something. And maybe in three years from now, we produce a new version of the standard. But, but again, I'm happy to try any approach, even continuous delivery and forgetting about versioning. Let's try that for six months or whatever. And then we discuss again. So I'm happy with any decision the board may take. So I think the action right now is based on this discussion to, for Georg to kind of assemble thoughts on maybe not pros, cons, but maybe just um, ways to think about versioning differently. I don't mean to put anybody in a con camp. Just a, I think maybe just framing, you know, a synthesis of all the things that have been discussed. Yeah. Now, I think that the main advantage from my point of view of continuous delivery and not taking, not taking anything or, or something is that, first of all, you can always say, well, you need to support the latest version, which is nice, but I don't know if that's doable. And, uh, and second, you don't need to care about versioning. So you need to, don't need to do a cleaning over time, um, every three months or whatever. You just say, this is the version, go to the website, and this is always the latest version. And that's it. And, and, and let's forget about the story. I think part, one of the reasons, I'm sorry to keep going. Don, did you have something to say? I saw you pull your headphone down, <laughs> which usually indicates that you're <laughs> yeah, about to say something. muted up and down <laughs> and it's on. Um, Go right ahead. Well, you, you said something about not putting together pros and cons. Um, I think we need pros and cons. Maybe I'm calling it that. So we I have. I uh, call it cons because I don't want to say that anybody's <laughs> idea is a bad idea. Like no, 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 I'm not saying that release is the pro and continuous delivery is the con. I'm saying what are the advantages and disadvantages of versioning? What are the advantages and disadvantages of continuous delivery? They both have advantages oh. and disadvantages. <laughs> and, and if I were to summarize I mean, from what I've just heard here, the advantage of continuous delivery is lower administrative overhead and the advantage of 
version of delivery is that we have a clear sense of what is active and current and we can point people to it. Yeah, we, we can also frame it in terms of what you can do and what you cannot do with its model. So for instance, with continuous delivery, you can just uh, say, this is the latest version, forget about anything else. You cannot tag to a specific points in the past history. With versioning, you can point to tags in the, in the past history, but you cannot just say, go to your repository and that's the latest version because we are, you need to wait until the release. So maybe framing this way, what can you do and what you cannot do with this model could be also useful. And it's not saying this is better or worse, depends on your scenario. I just put something in the chat. Are you all familiar with this license list? No. I am. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's the one that Kate was talking about in the last meeting, I think. Yeah, I think this is part of her argument for, again, it's, I don't really remember, but it's, it's being able to see what the current state is. And so with respect to SPDX, if you are on their license um, email list, there's a lot of conversation that goes on about including new licenses on this license list and how, how to go about doing that. But those conversations aren't necessarily reflected in this list. It's only post-release that something is approved or it's only after something is approved and then at a, at a point in time that this license list gets updated. Yeah, but at the same time, you can say my software is supporting SPDX version 3.4, for instance, which is the one we are seeing right yep. now. And, and that's that's quite important because in that case, I know that all the licenses in this list are supported by my software and the names and the tags and everything they're going to use is exactly what this document says. Yep, exactly. And so this, this list kind of um, disambiguates the the messy conversation that's occurring yeah, exactly. um, about yeah. including new metrics that that's all and those new met or, or new licenses in this case and so it just it creates a separation between those two so i have a question based on what uh, ray was asking earlier and looking at this list and is it important to have past releases on the website. Is it enough for you, Jesus, to have here what the current version is? And if someone wants to talk about an older version to point them to the GitHub repository, or do we need all versions on the website? So I really don't know. The important thing is that you can recover them. If they are widely used, the most use, the most easy to, to, to see them is the better. So that would mean let's use the website. If only a few people are going to use them and they know that you can go to the repository, that's also good enough. So I'm, I'm here I take the, the, the idea from the Python documentation, for instance. In Python, you know that the release of change works and uh, the meaning of different functions and the parameters and everything may change from a version to the next one. Most of the people are working with a specific version of Python and they need to know for my specific version, this is what I have. And therefore, they have that in the website, and they have all the versions of all the functions in the website. And, and that's nice, but that's not needed if most of the people are using a single version, say the current one, and only a few people are looking at the other one, and those now that you can go to the repository. So, uh, I, in other words, for now, yeah. I think the latest version could be good enough. <laughs> Okay, I, I think that gets to the point Ray was making about how much overhead it would be to maintain all of the past versions and have a number switcher on the documentation page. But in any case, maintaining them usually is just copying them at some point, and once you have them in the website, you don't need to go to them anymore, so they need no maintenance. Once, because they are not going to work, because for the yep. very reason... I will synthesize all of the arguments that we've had over the past, I'll go back through the old videos, listen to them, and okay. come up with a list. Okay. In, in any case, uh, I suggest that, you, that, that we take three discussions which are going in parallel, but I think they are different. The first one is whether we want to do releasing or not, continuous delivery or releasing. The second one is whether we want to do releases at the level of all the metrics together or at the level of a specific metric. 
And I think we have a certain consensus that the idea is to do it at the level of all of them. But still, this is another discussion. And the third one is how to implement this. Whichever the decision we take, what goes to the repository, what goes to the website, and how we tag everything. And the, the three discussions, I think, are different. Sometimes we are, we are um, mixing them, and that makes more difficult to take decisions. Thank you, Jesus. That was a good summary of the different decision points we need to have. On a completely separate note, um, <laughs> I you know I know these are informal meetings, but we have a lot of really good discussions. And you know, Georg makes a point about going back and and having to watch the videos to synthesize the discussions. Have we have we thought about maybe having notes for this meeting and just assigning a note taker at the beginning I of each one? Oh, Sean was the note taker for this one. Okay, where where did those notes go? Well, we hadn't been doing them outside of the monthly, and so we'll, oh, okay. start, post, we'll start posting them. I'm just going to follow the model that DNI does. Okay, just one big document with the new notes at the top. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Thank you. Yep. Maybe we can update our website and include the meeting minutes as a link there on the participate page. To the big Google Doc, you think? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So that for each call, we have a Google Doc where we keep the minutes. For each working group or for each call? For each, for each continuous call. So okay. one for this okay. meeting, one for the working group. So That's a great idea, actually. And then we'd have basically four link five. So many, so many links. We'd have a link for the to the DNI growing document, a link to the uh, this meeting growing document, a link to risk, a link to GMD, and a link to common. Is that right? Yes. Okay. It's a good idea. Uh, George, do we also have link of this conversation, like the recordings to the GitHub page? Because we specify like a section where the meetings and things like that. In that case, maybe somebody joining you could also go like backward to see some, some of the things that we discussed or like, at least the notes and things like that. We should have a pointer to some of these uh, meetings, like the previous right. meeting. Yeah, we have the YouTube page that I post all of these on. And I've started to post the transcripts as well. Kind of as, I don't know how, they're, they're okay. But I don't know if we point to the YouTube page off of the participate. Yeah, because I think we should point to those uh, things so that, you know, sometimes even when we want to go back and replay like what was said in the meeting to help yep. out of the context, we can still go back and call ourselves. Certainly. Yeah, so. for... For time, I was posting the meeting minutes from the monthly meeting and the YouTube link together in an email, but then I stopped doing it and no one missed it so far. Okay. Uh, good. Cool. This one went long. This was an, almost an hour. Did anybody have any other no, uh, comments? We didn't even get to working group updates. Oh yeah. Well, this isn't the official um, weekly or monthly one, but are there? Do, does DNI have things they'd like to talk about? DMD? Anybody? In four minutes? Because we didn't get to those. You're right. I normally ask those. Common risk. All right. Um, Hearing none. <laughs> I think we're good. We'll save it all for next week. Yeah, I'll, maybe next week we'll start. Um, we'll start with the working group updates. Make sure we save that time. All right. Cool. All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Bye. -bye. Bye.